Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the regular meeting of the Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church Chapter of Sinners Anonymous. My name is John, and I'm a sinner and your speaker today. Let us open this meeting with a moment of silent prayer followed by us saying the serenity prayer found in your Sinners Anonymous Big Book at Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 3, also known as the Lord's Prayer. Let's bow our heads for the moment of silence. Join me, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sinners Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their common experience and their strengths, their hope, and their joy with each other so that they may overcome their common problem and help others to recover from the sinfulness of selfishness. The only requirements for membership is a desire to stop sinning. There are no dues or fees for Sinners Anonymous membership. We are self-supporting through our own donations and contributions. Sinners Anonymous is not a political organization, but supports those causes dedicated to the salvation of and the moral uplifting of our fellow men. Our primary purpose is to accept the righteousness of Jesus, to walk with him, and help other sinners to accept Jesus' righteousness and to go forward living lives of holiness and service. Amen. Brother Lance will now read from the Sinners Anonymous Big Book <laughs> in selected portions of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I say unto you, love your enemies, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor for your body what ye shall put on. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Thank you, Brother Lance. We're all instructed and unlifted, uplifted by these powerful passages. Now, okay, I, I, I think everyone's getting the picture here, and I hope you will forgive me for having borrowed a page from Alcoholics Anonymous, but I wanted to get us thinking about why we are members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, why we're here today, and what we're about. You know, the title of this sermon was Probation Ends Soon. And it was thinking about probations that led me to what I've seen often imposed as conditions of probation. Alcoholics Anonymous or other similar programs are often among those conditions of probation. As you know, I do court-appointed criminal defense work. I see many different people as they're being processed through the criminal justice system. And just last week, uh, this week, I was throwing up my hands and banging my head because of the stupid things my clients have been doing. 
And the fact that they keep doing more stupid criminal stuff, even while they're on probation and already facing serious prison time. They just can't seem to help themselves. Does it sound familiar? Hmm. In my line of work, many people are put on probation. Being put on probation means that one has already been convicted. He has already been declared guilty. The judge declares then that imposition of sentence is suspended. And the person is then placed on probation for a specific period of time. If the person performs well and does everything that he's told to and commits no new crimes, probation expires and the sentence is never imposed. One recent cl client who was only a couple of weeks out of jail was walking down the street and saw a bicycle through an open garage door. He went in and took the bicycle. Because he entered the building and had committed a theft, he was charged with a burglary. Because this made him a repeat property crime offender, his standard sentence would be 13 months in prison. Now knowing all of this, his explanation for what he did was, they left the garage door open. <laughs> as if an open garage door is a sign that says, come in and steal my stuff. I assisted another young gentleman a few months ago for drug crimes and for stealing and using somebody, his, his acquaintance's ATM card. Now he's in trouble for doing the same thing again to his girlfriend and forging checks on somebody else's account. And his excuse is that he has a drug problem and needs drug treatment. And just like the first guy, he's facing several years in prison for being a repeat property crime offender and he's also a repeat drug offender and has been on probation for drug offenses. Now being on probation for drug offenses always carries the condition that the probationer attend and complete substance abuse treatment. Now he reasons that because he had never completed substance abuse treatment and wanted to do it now, the court should put him on probation to give him a chance to do it and not send him to prison. Now, when I confronted him by asking, but weren't you ordered to do treatment two years ago? His response was, yes, but they didn't make me go. <laughs> you know, what is the common element in these two stories? It's really warped and really twisted thinking. Now, the purpose of probation is not just to require somebody to check in and not just to require somebody to do stuff and not just require somebody to go to jail. The purpose, on pro the purpose of probation is that the probationer will receive conditions of things that he needs to do and habits that he needs to develop while he's on probation. Some of these conditions could be what's called MRT, it's moral, called moral recognition therapy, to teach them ethics and values. Another one is victim empathy, where they meet with victims of crimes, how they explain how they've been affected and their lives have been turned upside down and now they're fearful because of the, the behaviors of the criminals that have hurt them. There's classes on recognizing their criminal thinking. There's drug and alcohol treatment, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, there's Narcotics Anonymous, there's anger management, there's batterers intervention treatment programs, community service, and frequently there's some jail time to acquaint the person of what they're going to get more of if they don't toe the line and do their stuff. Other conditions might be get a job, keep the job, go to school. Stay away from certain people and places like bars or drug houses. Stay away from drug addicts. Stay away from drug dealers. All of these programs and all of these conditions of probation are intended to reform the person. They're intended to reform the person from the inside out so that the old impulses, the old reactions, the old associates are replaced with more healthy thinking patterns healthier behaviors, and healthier friends. 
So if we really want to win the war on crime, we have to do something about the criminal mind. We have to change the personality of the criminal. He must develop a moral character in place of a self-centered one he has been, that, the, that he's been operating with all this time. And I'm so glad I'm not a judge. I'm embarrassed to say the same things over and over again for my clients. They hear it from every one of us defense attorneys. It gets so old hearing it hundreds of times a month. The story is the same. I'm sorry. I made a bad decision. I won't do it anymore. I'm a reformed man. Trust me, you won't see me in this courtroom again until next week. <laughs> Give me another chance to prove that I really mean it. However, the most convincing evidence of a person's reformation is not what he says, but what he does. The diligence in doing the work, the diligence in attending the classes demonstrates the desire to be changed and a willingness to work at changing and forming a new personality and a new character and new habits. You know, because the definition of character is what one does habitually whether anyone else is looking or not. That's what character is. And that is the purpose of probation, to develop a new way of thinking and a new way of acting to change who the person is at heart. Did you ever stop to think that probation is a biblical principle? Being on probation is an opportunity for a convicted offender to demonstrate that he wants to change, he wants to become a changed man, and that he would choose differently if presented with the same temptations again. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, in other words, demonstrate, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does it take to be able to demonstrate the perfect will of God? A changed mind. A reformed, transformed, renewed mind is what it takes. You know, we have biblical examples, many of them, of probation. The first probationers were Adam and Eve. God had told them, if you eat of this tree, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. You will. God said it. It must be true. Did they die? They died vicariously in the lamb that provided them with their clothing, that provided them with their robe of righteousness. Somebody else took the penalty, took the sentence, and Adam and Eve were then placed on probation to be reformed and transformed and to choose again and to choose right this time. It's not a matter of just not doing bad things. Because you can't help doing bad things when your mind hasn't been transformed. Abel chose to work his probation. He chose to do what he was told to do. He chose to obey. He chose to offer the sacrifice that God told him to offer and in the manner in which God told him to offer it. Cain refused to follow the terms of probation. The story of Noah and the ark is another probation story. You know, they didn't know when it was going to rain. They didn't know when it was going to flood. Noah didn't know that. You know, and that's the same position you are in today and I are in today. We don't know when the probation's going to end. We know that it will. 
He preached for 120 years to warn people that they needed to start complying with the terms of their probation because every human being that's born on this planet is here only because Jesus died for us. We are alive today only because Jesus died for us. Because we are born sinners. And so, they had probation. They had somebody telling them what the conditions of probation were. The condition of life, the condition of, of escaping the death sentence that was imposed by God when he announced the flood. Let's get on the ark. That's the only condition. Get in the boat, people. They refused the one simple condition. One. They didn't change. They didn't trust enough to obey. They didn't believe God. You know, there's many other stories of probation. You know, one of them was that, that Israel was the children of Israel in Egypt for 430 years because the cup of iniquity for the Amorites was not yet full. God gave the Amorites 430 years after Jacob went to Egypt with his children. And then their probation was over. And they fought against God's people and they were destroyed. You know, we were just, uh, as has been mentioned, we've been studying the book of Daniel the last couple of months here, and we've, one of the greatest stories of probation is the 70 week prophecy of Daniel chapter 7 and 9. 7, 8, and 9, I guess I should say. That portion of the 2300 day prophecy. Seventy weeks are set aside, are cut off for your people. Seventy weeks. To bring in righteousness. And to overcome iniquity. They claimed to be God's people. But they had none of his character. And they had none of his works. They were proud. They were prejudiced. They were hateful. They were selfish. They were mean. Jesus told the parable of the vineyard and the husbandman. And he says, the vineyard's taken from the husbandman and given to others. They had... 490 years of probation. But they didn't develop any of the character that God wanted them to develop as a nation. There were individuals, of course, who did. But as a nation, they did not. And at the end of their probation, they were destroyed. Because they had not been reformed during their period of probation. They had not been transformed during the period of their probation. You know, Jesus, or God gave us in the sacrificial system snapshots of how the plan of salvation was going forward with all the feast days in the yearly cycle. And the last one was the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, and as Tom was talking about in, in Sabbath school today, the sanctuary service explains so much about the plan of salvation and what God is doing for us and how he's doing for us. And most of the world hasn't the foggiest idea about it at all. We need to understand it. We need to know it because our confidence 
in God rests on our knowing that his promises are true and knowing what he's doing for us right now. And so the Day of Atonement was to be a day of continual confession, continual self-examination to see if there's anything in my life that I need to get rid of, that I need to confess, that I need to abandon, I need to surrender. They never knew when the high priest was actually going to come out of the sanctuary and there would be no more mediation for sin. They needed to get on it right now. They needed to get on it to this minute. They needed to be focused. They needed to get down to business if they wanted to be pure and forgiven and right with God when the high priest discontinued his ministry of mediation. They had a limited time to be cleansed and purified. They had a limited time to have a purified and Christ-like character. Because of Adam's sin, we're all condemned already. In John 3, verse 18, Jesus said, He that believes on him, speaking of himself, is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So until we come to believe in the name of Jesus, until we come to believe in Jesus, we are condemned. Until we come to trust him. But as in Eden, execution of sentence has been suspended to see if we are willing to let Jesus suffer our sentence and to respond to that by cooperating in the formation of a new character identical to his. What this means is that you are on probation for life. Each of us must demonstrate that what Jesus has done for us has changed us and is changing us into his likeness. At the end of every probation, there is an examination to see if the conditions of probation have been satisfied. Have we done our community service? Have we overcome our addictions and our bad habits? Have the claimed changes actually taken place? Is our claim to be a Christian, one who is to be like Christ, provable by demonstrative, ev uh, demonstrative evidence? Only those who have claimed to believe in Jesus, only those who have taken responsibility and confessed their sins are examined to see if they really meant it and to see if they have been reformed. Have our habits and have our desires become like his? Here's where many of us have trouble. Grace and works, grace or legalism. Does what we do affect our salvation? The answer is yes, it does. Behavior does not earn us forgiveness or mercy or grace or eternal life. That is a free gift if we claim it. But what we do after we claim the gift shows whether we really want that gift or not. James wrote that we can believe in Jesus, we can claim salvation through the cross, we can claim salvation through his death, and we can claim eternal life. We can believe it. But if it doesn't result in a change in our lives, that faith is as good as dead, it's just as if it never existed at all. No faith equals no salvation. He says true faith is demonstrated. True faith is demonstrated by good works. Real saving faith is demonstrated in the lives of Christians. True Christians. True Christians act like Jesus. In Romans chapter, or I mean in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In this text, Jesus equals light. So if you were writing a, uh, a mathematical formula, it would be Jesus and then an equal sign and light, right? 
As Tom pointed out in Sabbath school, as I was amazed again, he preached the sermon. So it said, so you who are in Sabbath school get to hear the same thing twice. You who weren't there for Sabbath school just only get it once. But Jesus also said, you are the light of the world. If Jesus equals light and you equals light, you equal Jesus. Simple logic. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, when you put those thoughts together, it's just amazing. It's really dramatic what jumps out. It says, you are the Jesus of the world. Let your Jesus so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father and his Father which is in heaven. That's what that means. The world cannot see Jesus, but they can see you. And when they see you, they should be seeing Jesus. If they are not seeing Jesus in us, through the things we do and the things we say, then our claim to grace and salvation is just a false claim. We are taking his name in vain, and we have become commandment breakers. In the civil law of contracts, another word for contract is a covenant. Parties are bound by agreements and mutual performance. One promises to do something and the other person promises to do something else. You know, in real estate negotiations, there are often what are called conditions precedent. Which means that you must do something before the property is yours. So if you buy a house, there's a condition precedent before it's really yours. You have to pay for it. Then it's yours. To get a clear title, you've got to pay. Now this is the basis of all false religion. To get something, you have to pay. For the favor of the gods, you must first sacrifice. And the more costly the sacrifice, the more favor you get. And the unfortunate, ultimate conclusion is that child sacrifice would appease the gods. The children of Israel fell into this trap and joined the heathen in burning their children to death to earn the favor of the gods. But there is no condition precedent for the salvation offered by Jesus. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still his enemies, he died for us. While we knew nothing about him, he died for us and offered himself in our place. That transaction was completed at the cross when Jesus offered himself without condition, unconditional love for us. And when we accept that, and when we believe that, our title to that mansion in heaven, our title to eternal life is recorded in the books of heaven. Our name is written in the books as owner. Our heavenly citizenship is registered. To become a citizen of this country, the United States, you have to pay money, take classes, pass a test, swear an oath, and have somebody else promise to pay for you if you don't do good. To become a citizen of heaven, you just have to say, I believe. And I accept what Jesus did for me. But, continuing to be a citizen or continuing to hold that title is another matter. Because in the law there are conditions subsequent. They were there all along, but they didn't come into effect until the citizenship or the title was claimed. They didn't come into effect until your name was recorded in the books. And now that you are a citizen of heaven by the grace of Jesus' death and your belief in him, you are expected to become an ambassador for Christ. 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now you are expected to become an ambassador for the new Jerusalem. An ambassador is somebody who is expected and required to represent perfectly his home country. And just so, we are expected to represent our true home, our true country, the New Jerusalem. And if we don't want to do that, then we give up our citizenship. We have surrendered our citizenship. We turn it down. We reject it. And our names are removed from the book when we refuse to act as an ambassador. You know, another couple examples of conditions subsequent. And I used some, got some examples out of somebody else's work. But a man might give a piece of property to his son with a condition that you don't grow marijuana on it. <laughs> if the son grows marijuana on it, the property is forfeited and goes back to dad. He no longer gets to enjoy the property because of the condition subsequent. I thought of another example. Those of you who know anything about motorcycles. Say someone gave to me, gave me title to a brand new, and I, just, I looked it up on the internet here, Ducati Super Leggera motorbike. It's a racing bike and it costs about $65,000 and it's mine. They gave me title, it's registered in my name down at DMV. But there is a condition subsequent. I have to use it sometime in my lifetime. I have to learn how to ride a motorcycle. I have to get a license to ride a motorcycle. And until I do those things, I can't ride my motorcycle. I already have it. It's mine. It's registered. I've got it. I own it. But I can't use it. And when we accept salvation, we have eternal life, but you don't get to use it. You don't get to use it if you refuse to meet the conditions subsequent. And the conditions subsequent... We're expected to cooperate with Jesus through the Holy Spirit to become fit for heaven. We're expected to cooperate with Jesus in having our sin cancer cured. We're expected to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in having our minds renewed and our characters changed. The way we think has to be the way Jesus thinks. To be fit for heaven, we must be like Jesus. The things we want, the things we do, must all be in harmony with the principles of heaven. 2 Corinthians 10 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. This is a mind thing. And every high thing, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. As Christians, we acknowledge that we've been convicted and condemned by death, to death by the law, I'm sorry. As Christians, we claim the free grace offered to us by the blood of Jesus and his taking of our conviction and our sentence of death for us. As Christians, we accept the probation offered to us to give us a chance to regain that divine nature and to develop the mind of Christ so that we are cured of our sin infection and we're safe to be allowed into heaven. Sin started in heaven. The angels don't want it back. They don't want us there if we haven't got the sin problem cured. You know, the text that I had Lance read from the Sermon on the Mount are a statement of the principles of the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, you find that they are an 
outline of the conditions of probation, of what it looks like to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Love to God and love and mercy for our fellow man. They show that the mind of Christ is required in every believer. Anyone who claims the name of Christian must cooperate in his own reformation and perform the conditions of probation. And he must do them during that period of probation that's granted to him. As I mentioned before, in earthly courts, the most convincing evidence is what a person does and not what he says. And so it is in the heavenly judgment, one's life, is the best evidence of whether he has really accepted salvation and whether he has really, really wanted to be changed. The life of the believer is the evidence of a true change of character. The works of the obedient Christian do not pay for salvation, but they evidence that he believes that he has it and that he wants to be ready to take his place in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Let men see your good works. In Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says, behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man. What? As according as his work shall be. The works show whether you are truly repentant and truly serious and truly committed to being like Jesus. And it's not easy. Each of us is on probation to see if we're serious about changing our character from habitual selfishness to habitual selflessness. Sin is selfishness, and righteousness is unselfishness. Are we developing habits and training our thoughts along right paths? How long is your probation? Only God knows that. We must be earnest about our character development now. All of us have heard that old financial planning mantra, people don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. And so... God has a plan for salvation. He has a plan for the salvation of the human race. He has a plan for your salvation. But you must also have a plan as to how you're going to participate and cooperate with his plan. We can't sit around because God can't do it for us. Some of the probationers I've worked with in the criminal courts have been ordered to attend two AA meetings a day. Some have been required to attend one a day or one a week. And this raises the question, how many Sinners Anonymous meetings do each of us need to attend each week? For habitual sinners like us, one meeting a week is probably not enough to help us establish habits, proper habits, of thinking, frame of mind, where our thoughts are. Are our thoughts in heaven? We cannot afford to lose heaven. We ought to have our conversation on heavenly things. There is no death there. There is no pain there. Why are we so reluctant to talk about these things? Why do we dwell upon earthly things? The Apostle Paul exhorts us to have our conversation. He says, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, verse 20. Christ will soon return to gather those who are prepared and take them to this glorious place. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9.28 Do we love to think of this event or do we want to put it off because we know we're not ready? 
The more we talk of Jesus, the more we shall reflect his divine image. By beholding, we become transformed. We need to bring Christ into our religious experience. When you assemble together, when we come together, our conversation should be on Christ and his salvation. And the more we talk of Jesus, the more of his matchless charms we shall behold. And the more we behold, the more we will be changed. Those who take no pleasure in thinking and talking of God in this life will not enjoy the life that is to come, where God is ever present and dwelling among his people. But those who love to think of God will be in their element, breathing in the atmosphere of heaven. Those who on earth love the thought of heaven will be happy in its associations and pleasures. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation 22, 3 and 4. Probation closes for each of us when we die, or when we make a final decision for or against God, or when Jesus finishes his work in the most holy place. There is no more chance to change then. Revelation 22, 11, that announcement, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Announces that all the decisions have been made. God has not revealed to us the time when this message, the message of the third angel, will close. He hasn't announced when probation will have an end. The scriptures say it is now time to work while the day lasts. For the night comes when no man can work. There comes a time when it's no longer possible to develop a reformed and renewed character. When Jesus rises up in that most holy place and lays off his garments and clothes himself with the garments of vengeance in place of his priestly attire, the work for sinners will be done and probation of all closes. When the pleading for sinners is ended, the case of every soul will then have been decided and there will be no atoning blood to cleanse from sin. And we won't know when that happens. We have no time to lose. We know not how soon our probation may close and Christ is soon to come. When probation ends, it will come suddenly, and it will come unexpectedly. But we can have a clean record in heaven today, and we can know that God accepts us, and finally, if faithful, we shall be gathered into the kingdom of heaven. We can have Christ's righteousness if we put on the robe. We can have Christ's perfect character when we put on the robe. And so we can, from the viewpoint of heaven, have a perfectly transformed mind because we have accepted the mind of Christ. And as I've talked about before, it is the intent. It is the intent. God honors the intent. The thief on the cross had no opportunity to develop a Christ-like character. But he intended to. He committed to doing it. And God took that as a done deal. Amen. He had perfect character on the books of heaven. He had the Christ-like character on the books of heaven. Because that was his desire and that was his intent and God honored it. Because if given time, he would have done it. We can have a clean record in heaven this day if that is our intent, if that is our commitment. All of us 
are accountable for our actions while we're in this world upon probation. All have the power to control their actions if we will. If we are weak, we can get help from our friend Jesus. He is a friend of the helpless. Jesus knows our weaknesses. He was one of us. And if we ask, he will give strength to overcome. He will give us strength to overcome the most powerful temptations. If we ask for it. In humility. Jesus gives all an invitation to the burdened. And he says, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is the strong ox. He's the leading ox. All we have to do is follow where he goes and copy what he does and he'll keep us in the furrow and the job will get done. Many professed Christians do not labor perseveringly or persistently. They make too little effort and are not ready and willing to deny self. The prayer of the living Christian will be to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that they may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Even many professed Christians today seem to have no earnest desire for this heavenly knowledge and remain in willing ignorance of the divine grace which it is our privilege to obtain. The only safety today is to seek the wisdom which will assuredly destroy all desire for corrupt knowledge, corrupt knowledge, for sinful desire. When we have acquired a relish for the pure, calm, satisfying joys of faith and holiness, every feeling of being in our beings will arise in hatefulness of corrupting pleasures. All can choose life if we will. Everyone can resist sin and take pleasure in the ways of righteousness and true holiness and be rewarded with eternal life in God's kingdom. Now is the time of preparation. None need to expect that God will do the work of preparing and fitting them up without their efforts. It is for them to work the works of righteousness and crowd all the right doing they can into the little space of time allotted to them before probation closes, that they may have a clean record in heaven. What is this telling us? We talked about it as sometimes uh, don't be weary <laughs> in doing good. There's a lot of good that needs doing. And the act of denying ourselves to go do something for somebody else is restorative, it's curative, and it is building the character and the mind of Jesus. Amen. If you don't want to do it, it's the thing you need to do. You know, we've talked about it before that if I'll go anywhere God sends me except Alaska, He's going to send me to Alaska. If I'll go minister to anybody except the drunk on the street, he's going to send me to the drunk on the street. How do we know if we're working the works of righteousness? Philippians 2 verse 5, 
let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant, a slave. And he was made into the likeness of men. And being found then in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He asked three times in the garden for any other way out. But he surrendered his will. He surrendered his desires. He denied himself and became obedient. How many of us are refusing to be obedient because I disagree? The life of the true Christian who is serious about his probation will be one of simpleness and humility. Simplicity of dress, simplicity of lifestyle, and simplicity of diet. A Christian life is a life of humility filled with service for others and self-sacrifice. And one of the ways in which we can measure whether we are working the works of righteousness is in honestly examining our motives and our responses to the standards of behavior taught by your church. Giving of tithes and offerings helps us overcome our selfishness. Not wearing unnecessary adornment helps us set a good example for people who struggle with vanity or extravagance. And it helps us as well, practicing self-denial. And I'm probably going to step on toes, but ladies have mercy on us. Wearing modest clothing helps us men keep our minds and eyes where they belong. A word to the wise. We need to have fewer distractions in church. Eating a simple diet, free from unnecessary stimulants, not only enhances health and spirituality, but exhibits to others that healthy lifestyle, healthy eating can be enjoyable. And if we ask ourselves why we are not willing to give up these unnecessary things, the reason usually starts with I. I like this. I don't like that. I don't want to. I don't see anything wrong with it. And where there's an I problem, there's a selfishness problem. And where there's a selfishness problem, there's a violation of probation. The whole purpose of our spiritual probation is for our minds to be changed from being I-centered to being God-centered and others-centered. What influence am I having on others who are struggling? Is my desire more important than the needs of another soul? Are my rights more important than the needs of another struggling sinner? Paul talked about that. He says, if this is a problem for somebody else, I won't do it, even though it's not a problem for me. He gave up his rights for the needs of another soul. Souls will be lost and our own salvation too if we refuse to give up our self-centeredness. All of us need to recognize our weaknesses. We need to be looking at them. We need to be, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, identifying them. And then we need to make plans. We need to make plans to start setting a good example for others. We need to make plans to start denying ourselves. We need to make plans to take up our cross and follow Jesus daily. By faith, this is from Steps to Christ. You became Christ, and by faith, you are to grow up in him by giving and taking. You are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements, and then you must take all. You must take Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. 
Here's a plan. Make a plan. This is from Steps to Christ, page 70. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in your service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day you may be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. Tom read, and it's in your Sabbath school lessons, so if you haven't read it, I'm going to read it to you. Tom read from Christ's Object Lessons in Sabbath School class this morning. <clears throat> Statement from Christ's Object Lessons that my father was given when he joined the church to memorize. This statement says, It's not easy to deny ourselves. Our old nature lingers on. Our old man doesn't want to die. Moreover, we cannot nail ourselves to the cross. No man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. And then the language of the soul will be, this is after we've consented for Christ to accomplish the work, see, then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property, keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. That prayer was the one that was on the card my father had. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. So what this means is daily, daily consecrate yourself to God. Consecrate your work. Consecrate your family, your relationships. Daily we must consecrate everything to God. Jesus knew that the young ruler with all the wealth had a heart problem. Jesus knew that Nicodemus with all his knowledge and education and training had a heart problem. Jesus knew that Peter had a heart problem. King David knew that his problem was a heart problem. Psalms 51, he says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, in my mind, in my heart, is what he's talking about here. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy freely given spirit. Everyone here is on probation. Will your conditions of probation be satisfied and completed when your probation closes? Friends, family, you are the light of the world. Does what you say, what you do, what you wear show Jesus the world? Does it show Jesus to the world? Are you ready to deny yourself daily? 
to take up that cross and to do the hard things that are against your inclination, to do the works of Jesus. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and see Jesus in you and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Behold that Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we all then with an open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That is the transformation of the character, of the personality that retains your title to heaven. It's a free gift, but if you want to keep it, it requires the denial of Jesus and the mind of Jesus and the heart of Jesus and the promise is there the promise is there we will be changed into the same image from glory to glory the same image of Jesus his character his likeness his righteousness. We're on probation. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Don't you? Let's pray. Our Father, when we look to the life of Jesus, we recognize that too much selfishness still has control of our lives. Lord, we pray today that as we look to Jesus and as we see what he has done for us, that there will be little stirrings in our heart, the desire to talk to him face to face, give him our gratitude and our thanks. And Lord, help us to do that now in the way we live and the way we work, the way we talk, the way we walk. Lord, we thank you that you have promised us victory over every sin, over every besetment, if we will deny ourselves and come to Jesus. And so today, each and every one of us wants to renew our commitment we want to claim our citizenship. We want to claim our title. And Lord, we want to take up the responsibility of ambassadors. We want to be the light of the world. Not because we're so good, but because Jesus is in us. And so we invite Jesus. Come into our hearts. We open the door. And he'll come in and eat with us and sit down with us and converse with us that he will live in us and through us to the honor and glory of your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus name amen